I was 10 years old. By the time I was 10 years old, one of the things you want to make sure you know and track along with me in my testimony is uh, I've been a, a, a prolific user of pornography. Uh, sexual uh, behavior from the time I was probably four or five on the, on the little cul-de-sac that I grew up in in Orange, in Orange County was, uh, it was just going on. And I can't explain it other than I know the devil knows <clears throat> who we are and he knows where we're going and he knows how to sow destruction before we even have a beginning to have an understanding of what it is. And so the devil is sowing destruction into my life. Pornography, by the time I was 10, I was the kid in school who was known as the distributor of these materials in school. I'm taking them to school. Now that was not necessarily a common thing at that day. Today, with smartphones and all the media that we have, this is very common. And it's just, the devil knows how to lay that groundwork. So unfortunately, I was one of the early purveyors of this material on, on behalf. And I had, you know, parents would call my, uh, my parents and say, what, do you, what is your son doing? What are you letting your son look at? And you need to understand something. Check out the spirit of the world. Because my mother was someone who actively got involved right in the time when I was right around that age, actively was involved in the women's movement. And the women's movement was, was, was something was about liberation. And so my, wife, my mother looked at that and she said, well, he's just growing. I need to let him work his way through that. And so instead of uh, 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 establishing a, a compass of morality for me, it was, it was, you know, just I don't want to see it, but you can have it. And so if you can have something that, you, that morally is, is wrong, your flesh, man, it'll just take right over. You know, flesh yes. is flesh. Amen. And so I began to feed that. So you need to follow that through my testimony. Uh, I, I began to play saxophone in seventh grade. I, I loved saxophone, and uh, I became quickly became proficient on the instrument. So that was again something that I, as soon as I recognized my gift in that on, on that instrument, that was a track that I was on. So I, I'm a worship leader. I'm a singer, uh, and most probably above all things, I would say that I'm a saxophonist, even though I don't pray, uh, play very often anymore. So saxophone, all of this is going on. And this is what God does. So this is how I come to a faith in Christ. Now, I minister to men who are in prison. Men who are in prison are men who come to a faith in Jesus Christ because they've had everything stripped away. All right? You, you, you sit down with a man in prison, and he's lost everything. House, car, family, relationships, uh, 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 self-esteem. Everything is stripped. You understand? And so God, as he breaks those <coughs> men, he opens the door. He says, now's the time. You, you need to look up. Amen? Because I'm knocking. Well, God is very interesting, and some of you may have experienced this in your own life. The way that God might got, got my attention was, instead of stripping everything away from me, He gave me absolutely everything I wanted. He just, I, 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 I wanted this, and God gave it. I wanted that, and God gave it. And, and what I wanted was to study professionally in Boston with a particular saxophonist, and God said, okay, you can have that. Now, I, didn't, I had no idea that this was God at, at work. But basically, I wanted to go to come to the East Coast and study with this man. And so I called him. He said, okay, you can come. I packed up my stuff, and I went to the East Coast, and I began to study. And as soon as I began to study, I came out, probably I was about four weeks into my lessons, and I realized every time I left my lesson, I was miserable. And the more that I stayed, and the longer I stayed, the more miserable I became. God gave me everything I wanted, and there was this huge hole in my heart that was there, because God, obviously, is the only one who can fill that. So... I began to be stirred in my heart. I have a, there's a lot of stuff that I have to leave out, but you need to know something. My wife, whom God was dealing with and working with, began to pray for me, and the circumstances unfold. It, it, they culminated to a point where she wrote me a letter. I was hoping that she would come and stay with me because of how lonely and miserable I was. And uh, she wrote me back a letter. She said, I'm not gonna do that unless we're married, unless I, I honor God. And uh, it, that culminated in basically a four week period where I did not speak to her at all. I was angry, I got very mad. And uh, God in that four week period, everywhere I went, the Lord began to speak to me. And I would walk back and forth from the train station and God would, was, was drawing me to himself. And I, I began to, it just culminated, man. God just spoke to my heart and said, I'm the one you need. You need to repent of your sin. You are a sinner. You see what I was missing in seventh grade was the revelation of sin. No man can be saved without a revelation of sin. Don't, don't ever uh, understand. I minister to people in prison all the time, and there are people who come in and they evangelize, and they, they say, everyone come up if you want to get born again. And so you got you know, 100, you, uh, however many are in the group, and they come up. If you don't have a revelation of sin, a personal revelation, 
There's nothing going on there. You understand? We're, we're de you're dealing with emotion at that point. So a personal revelation of sin is required for, the, to, for entrance into the kingdom of God. And that's God met me when I was 22. So that's how I got saved. Okay, so I'm born again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I got shortly afterwards, I got married. Uh, Caroline and I got married. She came to the East Coast. And um, what, what basically began to unfold from that time forward as I was growing in God. I, we lived in the East Coast for about three years, and that's where I believe that we met, right? First time, do you remember us from way back when? Uh, 90s, in the early 90s? Christian teaching. Yeah, man, back at CTWC, Christian Teaching and Worship Center, uh, 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 Paul and uh, Mona Johnian. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that was where the Lord led us and kind of established us uh, in church, and that's where I got founded after I got born again. We spent just a short period of time in the North End, but that was where we really got rooted and grounded in the Word. And um, there came a time the, the economy fell apart. <clears throat> we had to leave, and when we left... I had this interesting experience. Not too long before we packed the van and left, <clears throat> I had I was out taking the trash and I had the devil speak to me as clearly as I've ever heard him speak, and which he's spoken very clearly to me at different times. He said, "When you get go back to California, I'm taking you. When you go back to California, you're going to be mine because that's where your pornography and your sin and your stuff is 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 fully available." And I just want to let you know I'm going to have you. You're going to be mine when you go there. And so when I moved back, that's exactly what happened. I received that word. Fear gripped my heart. I received that word. And even though we were always in church and faithfully attending and God was doing things and building me up and I began to lead worship and things were unfolding, running all through my life, right in the middle, smack in the middle of it, was a life that was filled with pornography and sexual sin. Destroying my marriage, frustrating. You understand the frustration that happens when a man's in mixture, when a man is in mixture, and it's prevalent. It's even more prevalent now in the church. Okay, so here I am living in mixture. Basically, 10 years of misery. Uh, we, we went to California. Life was good. Uh, everywhere I went, God blessed me. He opened up new job opportunities. Uh, I was still as miserable as I'd ever been. And it was time to leave. We had to leave. We had, our family started moving east, so we came back east. 1997, we moved to the east coast, and I thought for sure when I came back east that things would, would clear up for me, that I would be, you know, you can run from your trouble, but you can't run from your heart. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I thought I could do. I thought I could run from my trouble, but my heart came with me. And so things culminated right at the turn of the century, or the turn of the millennium, I should say, and uh, God began to really break me down. The Lord really began to, I, I, I was so frustrated by my inability to be free from sin. Now you may look at me and you say, well, why can't you be free from sin? And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. You're a born again man. You profess Christ. You're leading worship. There should be freedom manifested in your life. What's going on with you? But you see, all through the time that I was going to church those 10 years, there was an absence of discipleship concerning the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. What the cross has done to me, Doug Gregan, the fact that I'm crucified in Christ and that I'm risen in Christ never was really never brought to me. And so because of that, I lived in a, in a state of powerless, this roller coaster of sin and repentance, victory and failure, not understanding the power of God that was available to me if I simply stood on the finished work. That's a mystery to us. It's a mystery that there's, that there's nothing I do but enter in by faith into a finished work that I participate in, that I feed on, that keeps and sustains me. It's a mystery to most of us, to many of us. And so I, I struggled for so long, and it, things came to a head, and uh, God broke me down, man. And, and everything came into the light. There's so much to tell. I want to move on. But there's so much to tell as God began to, to show me what was required for freedom. You can't keep things in the dark and expect to be a free man. Amen. It all comes down to the issue of authority. If you're dancing with the devil, how can you walk in freedom? How can you resist him? You see, it's an issue of mixture. It's an issue of, an issue of authority. And so I was, I, because I wasn't under the authority of Christ, I couldn't walk in the freedom of Christ. And God began to bring me to that place. So there's a, just a couple things I want to share with you that God showed me in this. After 10 years coming out of sexual sin. Number one, he showed me that brokenness was, the, was absolutely a requirement for freedom. Amen. 
brokenness before a holy God, brokenness before your sin, instead of being upset about the consequences of your sin. I minister to men who are so broken over the consequence of their sin, but they're not necessarily able to see that, again, just as David says, against you and you only have I sinned, O God. That's the critical turning place. Where, why are you broken? Are you broken because you've lost your family? Good. Are you broken because you've lost your children? Good. Are you broken because your life is a mess? Good. But are you broken because you've grieved the heart of God? That's what's necessary for turning, for really turning. It's absolutely necessary. So that was lesson one. The, the next lesson was the fact that I was dead in Christ and I was risen in Christ. That changed my life forever. That was truly the turning point when I realized that I am crucified. How, how many times, and maybe you've done this in your own experience, I can remember praying and I can remember meeting God in this truth, always praying, Lord, crucify me. Oh, Lord, would you crucify me with tears? Crucify me. But then one day God met me, and he met me through a book of, of that Watchman Nee wrote called The Normal Christian Life. You may have read it. And he said this. He said, stop praying that you're crucified. You're already crucified. And that changed my life forever when I realized I had something to, to push against. You see, when we pray, crucify me, you're, when, when you meet opposition, you've got nothing to stand on because you think something isn't finished. You think there's something more to happen. But God showed me, I've already done that. And now, because you know this, because you're standing in faith, you have something to push back against. And that really began to set me free. I experienced freedom for the first time when God brought me into that truth. It was awesome. So I am dead, and I'm risen. And this is how God has set me free. Isn't that awesome? Amen. God, man. Yes. Okay. After God showed me that, guess what happened? I lived for about one year. Uh, this is right around, again, just after the turn of the millennium. I lived one year free from, from sexual sin. When I say free, I mean that I, did, I wasn't a participant. I didn't participate in pornography at all. I didn't participate in masturbation. And, uh, and things were good, man. I, 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 I had never experienced anything like this. To have this kind of freedom was an, a, a remarkable thing for me. But there came a day when I fell. And when I fell, this is my third lesson, when I fell, I fell hard. And I was so grieved over having fallen back into this mess, and I was so broken, I thought, surely God is done with me. Surely this is the end, because here I am, I've been walking upright, I fall back into this mess, into this ugliness, I bring it back into my house. Man, God has got to just say, that's it with this guy, I am finished with him. But you see, the third lesson I had to learn after God showed me that I was, risen, that I was dead and that I was risen, was that his grace is sufficient Amen. and you you cannot put a, a limit on the long-suffering hand of God his mercies are new every morning and I had to learn how to walk in that true grace that's what true grace is not because of what you've done but because of what I've done on your behalf and so it again that took me I, I, when after I fell after that year of freedom that was the first time that I seriously thought about wanted, wanted to kill myself and I was just so done I was so broken, so frustrated, just, you know, uh, to the point where you say, you know, I'm just giving in, man. Why, why bother? Why bother with this? Because this is obviously who you are. And the devil comes in and he knows how to take advantage of these things and redefine you. I minister to men who are constantly being defined by, by external forces. You know, you're defined by your family. You're defined by the devil. You're defined by the world around you. They look at you and they say, what good thing can come out of you? And so that's what I thought. Here I am, I'm, I'm back in my mess, and, I, and the devil says, what, what good thing is coming out of you, man? Nothing. And I said, you're right. And so it, it, was, it, was, it took, again, another couple of years to really come out of that struggle and realize the, the great love of God it was one of the hardest seasons of my life. The last lesson that I've learned, and it, it's a lesson that continues, let me share it with you, is this. So by, what, the third lesson was... Uh, Everything is by grace, and I had to learn how to fail. The fourth lesson was submission to authority is absolutely necessary before power, uh, before power to live right is manifest. Now, let me, let me try to share this. If you're not submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ, you will always be frustrated in power. You can try to operate in power, you can try to speak power, you can try to say great things of faith, but if you're not submitted to the authority of Christ by holiness and purity, you're frustrated. And that is a hard and long lesson to learn. 
Because a man who's a sexual addict or a man who's a drug addict or a man who's an alcoholic, these men are worshipers of other things. And when I worship, I'm submitting myself to another authority. The scripture says, don't you know, Paul tells, you, tells us in Romans 6, do you not know that who, who you give yourself a servant to obey, you become the slave of the one that you obey? And so if there's mixture in me, the power to, for deliverance will always be frustrated. And it took me a long time to figure that out. Because there's always, you, you see, again, when you're an idolater, and idolatry is rooted in your heart, and you're not about daily about the business of uprooting that mess, uprooting that stuff in your life, you will find yourself stumbling and frustrated. So I, I pray that that bless you, and that 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 you. I pray that that bless you, man, because it it's it, it, it's the long. It took me the longest to, to to really get a handle on this. That submission to authority, the authority of Christ, the, in all things. Submission to authority is absolutely necessary before deliverance can truly come, before power to live right can truly come. Amen.